Hey guys, how you doing? Thank you for coming out from House of the Merrimack. I'm Captain Chris Velasquez here with Dandy O'Dowdy. And we have a good show tonight. Our good friend, somebody met over the last few years through all the various local shows. Yep. Super talented guy. You guys, if you ever come to any of the new report fishing shows, you've definitely seen him and he's done a lot more up and down the coast. He actually just came back from one from what, Connecticut? Yeah, Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut. Connecticut Fly Fishing uh, Association. I think that's what it was. There we go. Good show. So, good. Well attended. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So our guest tonight, guys, is Joe Calcavecchia. Did I say that right? Calcavecchia. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I'm a mummy. <laughs> it, it actually, it's a nice Irish it actually name. Means, yeah, it actually means old crowd. Does it really? Yeah, old crowd. So we're dealing with the old crowd today. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so Joe, Joe's the owner of Saltwater Custom Flies, where he makes his own, obviously, custom flies for saltwater fishermen. <laughs> They're really beautiful. They're really one of the biggest hits up here at the local trade shows. And he's an avid fisherman. He Fly fishing is something that Dan and I, I've never done. Dan's done a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I've done a fair amount of it. So, Not enough to call myself a true pro, but... Well, we're really well, interested cool. to what Joe has to say and some of the things he has to talk to us about tonight. So, Joe, would you mind just giving us a little bit of background about yourself before we get started here? Oh, God. I mean, I've been, I've been fishing forever. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, I used to get on the old bicycle, the old paper route bicycle with the basket in front and the old Boy Scout knapsack in the back with my fishing rod and my tackle box. And I used to fish all the local ponds over in uh, Stoneham, uh, Back Hollow and Pond Pond and all that stuff there when I was a kid. And that slowly progressed to, uh, you know, fly fishing. Yeah, so I feel like there's always like an event, though. Like something leads up to fly fishing. Did you see someone? Did it, What inspired you to take on cracking the buggy whip? Oh, God. Uh, it, to me, it was just a progression. You know who really got me, believe it or not? Uh, you guys know Peter Santini over at Fishing Fanatics? Yes, I, I know him. I met him a couple times. Yep. Nice yeah. guy. <laughs> well, him and I, uh, well, he's from uh, Medford, actually, and uh, him and I would always end up fishing together somewhere. You know, it could be down in Boston Harbor, it could be, you know, down in Hong Pond or anything like that there. And he was into fly fishing. If, if there was anybody I would say that that got me into fly fishing, it was him. And he'll tell you the same thing. I taught him how to, you know, cast a fly rod. Uh but it's pretty cool because him and I, you know, at the same age. And uh, like I said, no matter where I went, we always end up together <laughs> out of nowhere. And that's starting. You guys are both heavy in the salt water now, but that just started as a, as a young person growing up and fishing yeah, the ponds. You know, you know, 15, 16, 17 years old. You know? Those are the days. I also noticed that you had a paper route. That's also something very rare for you <laughs> yeah. these days. Yeah, that doesn't how I do. Do, you, do paper oh, even God. get delivered anymore? Uh, everything's mailed. You know, <laughs> no. you get all the mail now. Nothing, yeah, well, that's yeah, digital. Like, here's your copy of the Eagle Tribune. Yeah, yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah, that's wild. So you've been. So wh when did the tie, the fly tying begin? I mean, obviously you've been doing it for a while. Well, I used to go out in party boats all the time, and I would see these guys, you know, catching uh, cod, and it was mostly cod back then, cod and wolffish, and you know. Uh, you never saw any haddock, very, very rarely. And they were always using a teaser above the jig. And I'm saying to myself, you know, hey, why not tie some feathers on a hook and see if that works? Started doing that, started catching cod and stuff on the teasers. And uh, slowly that just progressed from there. But I used to do a lot of, uh, I used to make a lot of cod jigs, cod teasers, I should say, which was pretty cool. That's really you know, cool. Would you yeah. get, do you, did you get creative with the materials? Is there any type of wild material you would use? No. Everything was feathers and that old uh, fish hair. I still use the fish hair to this day. Yeah. I'm still, you know? like, I, I grew up uh, working on the party boats, and, again, like, those teasers are just killer. Like, some of the old-timers or the other yeah. guys who are really, really good yeah. – that yep. consistently are pulling up, you know, pool fish contenders. Yep. Um, with teasers usually a hot bite. And – I've always been a proponent of the feather teasers or the hair teasers as opposed to, like, the rubber grubs. I, yeah, they I just a always lot of, felt like they caught better. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what I saw. There were, a lot of them were using the rubber grubs back then. I'm saying, hey, I could do the same thing with a, with a bunch of feathers. So, and then, How did you so, learn? 
because you didn't have the internet back then. So nowadays, oh. everybody's probably just grabbing a YouTube video on how to tie a fly. I'm yeah. sure you got a it, few it out there all, too as well. It, it was all you know, self-taught. Uh, I mean, uh, God, I don't think I took an official class until like uh, I went to the United Fly Ties. I think it was in uh, Wuben back then with a good friend of mine, still to this day, Dave Benoit. Uh, at that time, he was living in Derry, and he, he took me down there. And I think that was my first official class. I mean, I didn't even know how to attach a, a thread or finish off a head. I used to do it the old rod building way, you know, get a big loop, uh, stick the uh, the end thread into the loop, and then pull it through. I mean, I didn't do know how to do a whip finish or anything else like that there. Uh, back to the... Uh, the feathered jigs, the feathered uh, tees, though, but that eventually led into. I started doing a lot of fishing in Boston Harbor when there was the uh, the bluefish phase, where it was all this alligator blues. I mean, you're talking the average bluefish back then was 14 to 16 pounds. Ooh. And uh, I used to do. Oh yeah, they were huge. I used to do a lot of wire lining back then. You know, 300 feet of wire, and then count off from that there on, on your day cron. And uh, it was all jigging. We eventually got to the point where we were tying all our own jigs. So that was another thing that got me into uh, fly tying. Kind of now, when you, for, say, uh, when you say jigs and equating that to fly tying, what kind of jigs are you talking about back then? Like the uh, parachute jigs? No, not the parachute jigs, the uh, hair jigs. What's I a hair jig? Par- oh, it was just, uh, you know, bucktail wrapped around a jig. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. No, you don't see that uh, up around our area at all. Hit? People you me, really? That there and Uncle Josh pork right on the back. Mm-hmm. Killer. You know, <laughs> yeah. You know uh, the old broomstick rod, ten senator, three aught senator, and jig like crazy. That was fun. That was a lot of <laughs> Sound, fun. Sounds tiring. <laughs> it was, but still, you know, uh, we used to. I mean, you know, an average day w- with us, if we didn't catch, you know, more than uh, twenty fish, we weren't doing things right. Yeah. You know, and they were all big, big fish. Let me shut my phone off. Sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. I don't know if you heard that. My brother from another mother's calling me, Joey, Joey Cadero, another big fly fishing guy. Another Irish guy. Yeah. <laughs> Portuguese all the way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so that's awesome. So it's it's interesting that, uh, you know, I don't know, the two different different types of fishing, that, well, the three different types of fishing, really, that ultimately led to you starting to tie the flies. The... Uh, the work that you do, though, is, like, super impressive. So, like, how many how many years of practice have you had now? Oh, God, I've been tying flies since I was 18. Okay. You know, started off with, uh, you know, all the little freshwater stuff, tying, you know, you know simple uh, dry fly patterns to simple uh, streamers and all that kind of stuff there. I remember I caught my first uh, fly on a tie, on a uh, fly that I tied. It was over at Han Pond in Wubin. They had a uh, a stream in the back. Uh, actually, they had a couple of pit ponds out there too, but I never forget it. I mean, you know, I was using my old uh, Martin Martin reel, you know, with a seven way fly rod, and I threw it out there. Gave it. A f- it was a black ghost too. A couple of strips, and man, I'm telling you, you know, you know, back then they started they stocked the trout big. You know, mm-hmm. 18, 20 inches was you know an average size, and I saw that trout come up and hit that fly, and it was like, oh, my God, I couldn't believe it. So that really got me hooked on the fly. Yeah, rod. that's like the – you'll never forget the first fish that you catch on a fly. Mine was uh, – Oh, yeah. I had like this – it was – I don't even know. It was just – it was a POS fly rod that I got from, like, Walmart just because I wanted to try it. I was curious. And I was I want to say it was like a uh, four-weight, and I was throwing some type of fly. I don't even know what it was. And it was it was a sinking – it was sinking. And – um. I hooked a fish, and I was at Plugs Pond in Haverhill, and I was like, oh, my God, this thing's a monster. It's a monster. And I get the thing in, and it was like, it was a sunfish, it was, and it was probably like, it was probably like two inches big. It was like the tiniest little fish, and I could have sworn it was this massive fish that I was bringing in. And I was like, wow, okay, I really know, I see how people like this. That seems to be a pattern with you, Dan. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I, thought, I like to break out the fish stretches sometimes, I guess. But then from there, um, it kind of progressed to uh, I was a big hiker for for a good amount of time. And I, what I did was is I had like a I, I still have it. It was a two weight Cabela's wart rod that would it was a six footer that broke into six pieces. 
So I would throw it in, in a backpack and I would go and catch native brook trout and streams and then hike up to all the native, like the, the helicopter stock ponds and yeah. fish those for days. Like go up there and oh, just wow. stay and had a great time. And it yeah, was, a, it was cool a really stuff. good time. I like, I never really got past nymphs cause like they were just easy to fish with. Uh, but you know, just the whole experience and on the whole was pretty damn awesome. Nothing yeah. cooler than catching like little tiny brookies that, you know, what you can tell are native, they have wild colors in them. Um, oh god, yeah, yeah, just super fun to do. Yeah, I used to fish uh, little little native brookies up uh, the Sugar River, up in uh, way up in New Hampshire, uh, up by uh, the New, uh, Newfound River. Oh, nice. Yeah, awesome. Newport. It's cool taking yeah, yeah. trips up there. Yeah, yeah, Newport, New Hampshire, the Sugar River. I have a confession to make. I've never caught a fish on a fly. I don't oh, think god. I've ever actually actively fished with a fly rod. Yeah, so Joe, with a guy like Chris, right? What would I do? So if he, yeah, if he were to like say, I, I'm going to be fishing, for, I want to fish for schoolies, uh, schoolie striped bass, and maybe maybe drop a flats. Like, what's he going out there with? What's he? What's he want to equip himself with? Oh, uh, get yourself a decent nine weight rod, okay? Nothing fancy. There's a lot of manufacturers out there right now that are offering rods in the uh, you know 100 110 dollar range. You can even get like an Echo set. For like a, under 150 bucks, and that includes a line too. So there's a lot of stuff out there for a beginner. Don't think that you're gonna have to spend hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on a setup because you don't have to. And fly equipment can get very expensive. Huh? Oh yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. You know. Yeah, like I've seen some of the like Seigler makes the uh, their fly reels are just unbelievably pretty looking. I don't know how they are how they perform because I don't really fly fish, but. They get pretty damn expensive too, like fifteen hundred bucks for a reel. Yeah, oh, they, yeah. they have yeah. tarpon reels. Yeah, crazy. I mean, it, it, it fifteen hundred dollars. Do you have to spend that kind of money on a reel? No, no. But in salt water, you have to get a reel with a, a halfway decent drag that's going to hold at least one hundred fifty yards of backing. Okay, that's just you know mandatory. Uh, what are you using for what do you use for backing for your fly reel? Because you have your fly line, right? And there's different types. Right. There's sinking, intermediate, floating. Am I correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And and that, that, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, I study up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but then for your backing, so you have a shot of line behind that. Are you guys using like braid, mono, um, Dacron? Just regular Dacron, you know. Just regular Dacron. I like to do something yeah, that I can add uh, line splice through. Dacron's yeah. the easiest way to do it, you know. It really is. Yeah, speaking of line uh, splicing, I just called Dan. I, I I did some. I moved some things in my basement around. I can't find my splicing needles. Ugh, it's the worst. They're like the 15, nearest, 20 bucks a pop. Yeah, go to the nearest uh, uh, music shop and get some uh, guitar uh, strings. Yeah, that's all. I oh use. yeah, you for the little loop. Yep. Good call. <laughs> Excuse me. No, good luck. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's the easiest way to do it. I do all blind, all my all my uh, lines are all blind splice looped, and you know it's it's really simple once you. Once yeah, you start it's not doing it's it. not difficult. Yeah. So we're um, yeah. So we also got the hollow needles because I'm making shark leaders and stuff and running it up the line. So yeah. Uh, all right, so I got you know I can go get a nine weight fly rod. You know if I'm lucky enough to get a package, it looks pretty good, awesome. Um, so what kind of flies? What are some of your favorite creations? Uh, well, creations, I wouldn't say, uh, <laughs> variations. Yeah. I mean, uh, fly fishing has been around for thousands of years. Uh, nobody has created anything though. Probably the past, you know, 1900 years, <laughs> <laughs> you know, all it is is different materials and different packaging. But I mean, you know, a bait fish is a bait fish, a dry fly is a dry fly and, and so on, you know? Are you uh, matching the flies that you're using with the line, or does it matter? Does it not matter? Uh, more so with the uh, rod weights. Okay. Uh, and line also. It's all a matter of balancing it all out. Like, I use a lot of weight-forward uh, sinking-type lines, mm -hmm. which is like a, a, the head of the line. It's only like 20-some-odd 20, 20 feet. And that's the second section. Now, a fly line is 100 and, normally 105 feet long. The first 20, 25 feet it would be your sinking section. Uh, and that's rated in grams. Okay. So uh, the lines that I like to use mostly are in that 250 gram 
to uh, 350 gram. A 350 gram line is going to give you a sink rate of about three and a half to five inches per second. So you, you kind of look at that there. You look at you know like 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 if I'm fishing down down the Cape or the Vineyard, we got super super small tides down there. Not like we have up here. Up here we got those 10 12 foot tides. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do a lot of fishing down the point down at Palm Island, and that's fast moving water when the when, when the tide's moving. So I'm using, like, even a 500-gram line just to try to get the line down. Mm -hmm. But you have to look at that there. Plus, they have flies that are weighted, okay, uh, weighted uh, as, uh, as in dumbbell eyes. Like, one of the first flies I, I, I actually fish with, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, I went to school with his kids, uh, Ralphie Surrett. Uh, he was one of my you know, biggest influences down there when it came to fly fishing. I mean, he was a guy that was always out there with his kids fishing, uh, you know, out in the boat or uh, off the shore. Uh, we were down there one time, and I had my, you know, my fly rod. I was probably still only, you know, maybe maybe 20 at the time. And uh, he was catching a bunch of schoolies over by the uh, captain's lady. And uh, I walked over there, you know, we started talking. So, Joey, and I was using the flies that I – was introduced to is all your southern type patents and they really didn't work up here so he gave me a little fly uh all it was was like four four feathers on a hook with some body braid around it some pearl body braid and uh a bee chain eye i swear second cast i was on to my first fish on a fly rod first strike on <laughs> a fly rod and that was you know freaking awesome and uh from there uh I uh, started, you know, tying a bunch of flies for that kind of stuff, using bead chain, bead chain, bead chain. And then I ended up going to, uh, we had an old fly shop up in New Boston, New Hampshire, Bill Hunter's. Uh, I started talking to him. He says, here, try these out. They had these new bead chain lead eyes uh, made by Wapsie. And uh, I tried that, and, you know, next thing I know, I mean, that one to two fish came to, you know, 20, 30 fish all in the fly rod, all in that one area, you know, Captain's Lady, all up, you know, to the point in the sandbar. Incredible fishing back then. Incredible. That particular area is probably a lot of people's first stripers. A lot of people's first stripers probably came off that yeah. little point. You know, oh, yeah. A lot of times when people yeah. ask me, oh, Chris, you know, I'm going, taking the kids out for sure for a couple of hours on the weekend. What do you suggest? It's, um, that's kind of like one of the first places I'll guide them to. Yeah, yeah, I've had a ton What's of luck that? over there, actually. Yeah. I don't know, it's like if you get it at the right time, you can catch like 10 fish in, a minute, in 10 minutes. Yeah. And I, you know, and it, I, you know it's, what's nice about that area, though, is that for fly fishing, you know, a lot of people leave once the tide hits low. But mm -hmm. for us fly guys, it doesn't really start picking up until after everybody leaves. You know, right at dead low into the first hour, hour and a half of the incoming. It's killer over there. Mm -hmm. Absolute killer. Because you got so many back eddies and uh, and everything else, the water's always moving. You always get it's those rip like, currents coming off the sandbar. You yeah, know, you get, yeah, there's, exactly. There's huge drop offs that go from like five to twenty feet on the other side. Yep. Like we see yep. them on our fish finders from our boat. Yep. And they're always hanging around Captain's Lady, anyways. You know, Captain's parties. Always. When I used when I used to work there, we chum bait. We like cut clams in the morning, right? And we get rid of the scallop part of the clams. And you would just feed the stripers under the boat. And if we got oh, yeah. there early enough before a lot of people came down, that's when we did our fishing. We would just put a piece of clam and you had to float it down behind the boat, you know. And there were times like, you know, the, these little stripers in some smaller keeper size, you know, you'd be floating down a, a chunk of clam with the rest of it and they wouldn't hit it. They wouldn't hit it. And you'd have to drop down a liter size or you'd have to try to cut the bait so it floated perfectly, maybe a little bit bigger so it would go down with the chum. Yeah, yeah, like educated. you learned a lot watching them, just watching them feed. It was really cool. Yeah, yeah educated, just like the French fries fish up at uh, up at Browns. Yep. <laughs> Are they, very, I haven't been educated. there in a while. They still feeding those things up there? I I have no idea. I haven't been up there in a while myself. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Joe, have you done any like big game fly fishing? Oh God, uh, big game as in I've caught and uh, I have caught. I haven't landed, but I have hooked up uh, a few times on bluefin. Uh, you know, oh yeah, the small, uh, small bluefin. Yep, that's uh, awesome. That was just a yeah. That was just that, you know. It, yeah, that must it, be it's a wild ride. It's actually scary. It's actually scary to feel that kind of weight on a fly rod. 
Yeah. I have caught some, uh, I've had caught a lot of blue sharks on a fly. Uh, I have hooked up on a few top and still haven't landed any top yet. On the fly no, that's rod. not easy. Yeah, that's not yeah, easy. Just regular fishing. Yeah. yeah. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I did. I have caught them on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, on the spinning rod when they're, uh, on crabs. That's down a Poca Grande pass mm. in Florida. Yep. On the on the west coast side, that's just some phenomenal fishing. Oh my god, it, it, it's crazy. You think the Merrimack River's bad? Huh, that's nothing. That's absolutely oh, nothing compared to in, in terms of boats. The, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah the that's absolutely nothing. When they're on, I can't a, even imagine. Grass, I'm scared just thinking about it. Oh, it's it, it, it's literally it's ten times worse. It's just crazy, absolutely crazy, and they're all hooked up on. 100 to 155, 150-pound top. It's incredible. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of fights and arguments out there? Or are they pretty oh, tame? God, they yeah. got it down pat? It, 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 it's, you know, what are you going to do? You're going to, you know, start, uh, you have to, you have to keep a, a cool head. Because yep. there's so many boats. But that's, I mean, Merrimack River is nothing compared to that. Yeah. Bump of boats galore. Yeah. Is there like yeah. five-foot swells in there, or is it at least pretty calm? Uh, I, well, I was out in a, a flash boat, and uh, it wasn't bad for us. I've been out there quite a few times, you know, with different guides and stuff, and uh, it's always been, you know, a little rough. I mean, you're out in a 21-foot flats boat. You know, it can get wet, but. Yeah. Yeah, it's more like wind chop, right? It's like yeah, just exactly. Really, it's always, yeah. It seems to always be windy. Yeah. Yeah, I've spent some time down at Bean Point, and uh, it's kind of the same thing. Like, the bo- boats will stack up. Everyone kind of drifts nicely, and then, yeah. um, yeah, it can be. Can be a little rough with the with the wind, but I I, I had hooked up. Uh, see, when did I hook up on the tuna? Actually, we were fishing in a school of Mickey Wills. It was pretty cool, and the Mickeys would just uh, hurt up all the uh, the uh, herring, and they're on uh, uh, the uh, the baby herring, baby bunker. And that's and, when like uh, the fly rod is like ideal for those fish, especially oh, God, in that yeah. size class. Yeah, I I mean the flies that we're using are only you know two inches long two and a half inches long top and you're tying them on uh, like a, an owner size one odd hook mm-hmm. and that's it and it's just crazy you see those mickey wheels herding up all the bait fish and then you see those tuna come crashing right through and you know the uh the shear waters are everywhere it's just crazy crazy fishing it's, it, it's the best oh yeah so you must use obviously a sinking line with that too right to get yeah, away yeah. from the birds yeah well i'm actually using a uh, a 14 weight rod with a uh it's an able number four and a half reel, which holds like you know six hundred yards of backing. Yeah, um, right. So it, you know it's all big, big stuff. So I kind of have an uh, understanding of how the rod weights work, uh, but for those that might be listening that don't understand, do you mind giving us like a general overview as to what like weight you would want to pick for which line and which fly you're throwing? Okay. Uh, well, all the fly lines out there are uh, graded to the weight of the rod. So if you're using, like they say, uh, like a seven weight fly rod, right? You want to make sure that you purchase a line that's seven weight. Some people will tell you you can go up a line weight, but it's recommended to fish. You know, especially when you first started, starting, it's recommended to use a line weight for the rod. Like uh, seven weight, you get a seven weight uh, fly line, either intermediate, uh, floating, or sinking. Uh, when you start getting into uh, the uh, weight forward sinking lines, like the uh, shooting head lines, uh, then you have to actually read the package and see what the uh, weight rod is recommended for that. I know Airflow will have Airflow lines, which is a manufacturer. They'll actually rate their lines to the rod. So if you get a... Uh, 350 gram line, you can get it for a seven weight. But Rio is completely different. You have to n- understand what that extra weight is going to do the rod. Like I'll fish an eight weight rod with a 250, and I'll fish a nine weight rod with a 350. That's just experience mm-hmm. right now. I worked in a fly shop too way back when, uh, American Angling Supplies. So I understood, you know, how to set up a rod and you know what is the right procedure for each and every rod out there in line. Awesome. And then, it's, it's, that... see, the real knowledge is going to your local fly shop and talking, and they'll explain everything to you. 
That's the best way to do it. This is the stuff that you're not going to learn online. Mm -hmm. And it's it, it's sad because we have lost a lot of fly shops in the past few years. But the ones that are out there now are, are, are pretty strong. Locally for our area, um, all I can think of is post fly in, in Well, that's, uh, that's not, yeah, that's not they, really a fly shop, is it? That's more of a mill order, isn't it? Yeah, they do. No, they have an actual physical building you can go into. Where? Now, really? Where? It's like p past the traffic circle on Route 1, if you're coming from Newburyport. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's kind of like oh, well, a little bit past the train station. Yeah. I don't know if they yeah. still got their building. They, it, was, it was new probably about four or five years ago. Yeah, because uh, my son, who's actually a, uh, an influencer, he's a food influencer, uh, he knew the girl that was running that. Isn't that uh, Chris uh, Pizzoni's daughter or something like that there? Oh, is it? Oh, oh, I didn't know yeah. that. No, I, know, I, I, I didn't she, know. Yeah. yeah I, I forget the guy's name. I met that. him at the beach coma at Plum Island once. Yeah. Um, oh man, I think his name. I think his name was Chris, but I know Chris was only. I don't think it was him. It was. It wasn't him. I know that. But oh, that's neat. But like otherwise, what other fly shops are around? Oh god, the the, the nearest because we used to have uh, first line anglers. They're gone. Oh, we have Nat coming on a podcast in a couple of weeks. Oh, good, good. good I can't good. wait. He's, yeah, he's good people. Now that's the guy to talk about tuna fishing. He's oh, that's where he's, we got a big plan for that one. <laughs> God, he's the one man. I mean, you know, he'll 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 steer you in every direction. He's he's good people. Ah, oh, good 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 people. Uh, God, I'm trying to think. What would be the nearest fly shop? You don't want to go to Bass Pro Shops or any places mm -hmm. like that because they really don't know. Uh, Eldridge Brothers up in Maine. Mm -hmm. You know, that's only what a half an hour trip. Yeah, it's not too bad. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you got Stone River in Amherst, New Hampshire. You got the. Uh, I mean, Bears Den will always lead you in the right direction over in Taunton, Mass. Yeah. Uh, it's hard because a lot of the. Uh, so many shops are gone. Those fins I know. and feathers and uh, Rowley or Essex, I mean. That was another one, kind of like the first light mold. Well you, well, you got Concord Outfitters. They're excellent over there. Yeah. Andy over there and, and his crew, they're all excellent people. They're all, they're all huge saltwater fly guys. Uh, and I give classes there also. Oh, so talk about your classes a little bit. Oh, okay. sure. I mean, I do uh, uh, everything I tie, I can give a, uh, a class on. Uh, beginner's class, intermediates, advanced. Uh most of my beginner's classes start off with, you know, learning learning materials, uh, tools, and, and how they use, and tying simple patterns like a clouser or a, a, a small deceiver or, or a blondes or, or, the, or those type of flies. Uh, real simple patterns. Uh, then I'll, you know, advance up to half and half, which I call a clausiva. Because uh, I called it a clausiva because it was I never even heard of a half and half when I was tying. That was one of the first flies I ever tied commercially. Uh now, when you say half and half, what's half and half about it? Okay, half deceiver, half clouser. Okay. Okay. So what's the difference between the two, or and then the combination of it? Uh, a deceiver. I'm taking a beginner's class right now. <laughs> okay, a deceiver. Uh, if you ever saw the uh, the fly stamps. Yeah. Okay, one of them is by Lefty Prayer, and it's a deceiver. He uh, originated the design of a, a deceiver, and uh, Bob Clouser who took those lead eyes that I was talking about before and made a fly out of it called, called the Clouser. Mm -hmm. And uh, the beauty of this here is that when you combine the two, you take the top half of the Clouser and the bottom of in the back half of a Deceiver, it makes one of the best flies out there on on Earth. And nice. it's called a, a, they call it a half and half, I called it a Clausiva. So it's, it's both the same fly. <laughs> it's awesome. So and, with the uh, with the classes, where are the where are the classes going on though? Are you oh, uh, how are you get, organizing them? Uh, I get classes at uh, Stone River over in Amherst, Concord Outfitters over in uh, uh, Concord, New Hampshire, uh, the Evening Sun over in Purple Mass. Uh, I do uh, a lot of stuff for Eldridge Brothers up in Maine too. Uh, I'm working on, now that I'm retired, I'm really starting to work 
getting back into, you know, giving classes and, you know, doing all the shows and, and really, really enjoying myself. Uh, I'm trying to work with stuff up with the uh, Bears Den and uh, Saltwater Edge down in Rhode Island. Uh, I try to get all around. You know, the Northeast here is my is my waters. I know these That's waters. Awesome. I fish a lot of them. Yeah. You know, I fish down to Point Jude, down to Rhode Island, strike the fishing. Uh, I've done a lot down to Vineyard. Uh, a buddy of mine uh, that I met at one of the shows, he was a native down there uh, living in Oaks Bluff, Captain Freddy. He's down in Florida now. Uh, I've done a lot of fishing with him. You know, out there with the Vanderhoops, you know, uh, you know, uh, Tomahawk Chatters. You guys ever hear of them? I heard of him, yeah. I heard of him. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's, he, he'd always have Jim Bellucci on the boat. Oh, out no there. kidding. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but I've done a lot of fishing down there. You know, the Cape, I've done a lot down at Pompanesset, Spit, and, you know, a lot of shore fishing down at Pompanesset. So if I wanted that's, to go that, to one I, of these... If I wanted to go to one of these classes, like, do you advertise it through yourself, through Facebook oh, yeah. or anything? Both. Yeah, everything. Yeah, everything and everything. And your Facebook is Saltwater Custom Flies? Yep, that's my Facebook. My, and your and website? It's also my website and, uh, and my Instagram. Cool. So people should, just, Custom Flies. people should just go check that out if they're interested in yeah. the, uh, going to one of your shows and one of yeah. your lessons. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Saltwater, yeah, Saltwater Custom Flies. I'll put my name in. Both yeah, we'll up. put a link awesome. on all the on all the stuff for you. Yeah. You know, I think it's pretty cool all the traveling you get to do with these shows. It's like you're hitting the road, you know, and you're out there. And I, I love it. Meeting people and and I feel like it's uh, yeah. fly tie like fly tying is such a niche. You know, there's not many people that do it anymore. And then um, even the fly fishing, you know, you're you're catering to a small percentage of the fishery, really. It's if you it's really tiny. think about it. But yeah. it seems like. It's uh, it's a minute amount of people, but they're the most diehard of diehard because we can't get in, interfere with a fly fisherman when they're trying to, you know, <laughs> go for that fish. Well, I tell you, though, you uh, the, the surf guys, though, uh, spinning surf guys are pretty diehard, too. Yeah. yeah. I'll do a lot of those, yeah, I'll do a lot of those uh, saltwater shows, and, you know, they are absolute diehards. I used to be the same. I know. I mean, you know, uh, I have a... a, a, a a 10-foot custom one-piece uh, surf rod uh, made by Tink Nelson. Uh, this is going back quite a few years. Uh, he had a, a zone fly shop up in uh, Summersworth, New Hampshire. Incredible rod builder. And uh, I just love that rod, too. All one piece. It's set up. It's set up. It, it casts like a dream. Uh, an old uh, Talon, which is a, a California rod make, ma- manufacturer, blank. And I tell you, what a nice rod that is! Oh, going down there. Do you uh, do you the, build your own rods too? I, I used to, not not anymore. I still got a whole bunch of blanks here, uh, but I, I built quite a few rods. Actually, uh, the father of our saltwater flies, our big saltwater flies, Bill Catherwood, mm-hmm. uh, he was tying all the stuff that you see now back in the fifties and sixties. You know, all these big, big, huge bait fish patterns and the, the needle fish patterns, all that stuff. That he was tying it all back then. Back then. Uh, I actually built him a rod and uh, back when I worked for American Angling Supplies in Salem. And, uh, oh, God, he loved that rod. And it was, it was, it was such a, uh, a, a thrill and an honor for me to build, a, build him that rod. But I, I, you know, I just I have so much fly time to do. It's just, it's hard for me to, you know, get all my rod yeah. building stuff out. What's the time the like rod. on the fly on the flies? Like, how long does it take to make one fly? It all depends. Like, I can tie a clouser, okay, a simple yeah. clouser, which is uh, saddle, uh, which is uh, bucktail, top and bottom with a lead eye, lead eye, and that'll take you know a couple of minutes. Okay. Or I can get into these hollow flies. Which is you mentioned parachute jigs earlier. A mm-hmm. hollow fly is like a parachute jig, all tied in reverse, but it, it, it has steps you can time. You know, from you know this big here to you know two feet long with extensions, oh. and it's all layers of bucktail tied in reverse parachute style, and that could take you know a couple of hours. Holy moly! On, on, on one fly, yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, I have a whole bunch of hollows here. They're my seven-step hollows, 
And, uh, you know, they were about ah, almost a foot long, you know, in that 10 to 12 inch range. And, you know, that takes me 45 minutes to tie. Get some big and fish I tie on a bunch though. of those. Oh, God, my God. <sighs> the fish. The fish that are being caught with these flies are incredible. You're talking, you know, 30 to 40 pound bass. Wow. Big, big fish. You know, you find a school of herring, you start throwing these flies because they look just like, you know, you know, bunker. Yep. Herring, you know, they look like pogies. You throw them in that there, and uh, same thing that I mentioned with wire, you throw out your whole fly line, uh, you give it a count, and you, you know, you look at your fish finder, you try to figure out where the fish are at. And you count and you start stripping. I had one guy I was just talking to, one of the guys I tied for. Uh, he's telling me, you know, he had a phenomenal year on, on the hollow flies. He says, Joe, the key is, believe it or not, is to strip it as fast as you possibly can because it looks like the fish is escaping. Start doing that because, you know, most of us, you know, would strip normal. But he mm -hmm. says, as fast as you possibly can, you see those bests, you know, now you got the competition thing going and they're just going to attack it like you wouldn't believe. Yeah, I was going to yeah. ask you, that was actually going to be my next question on the retrieves with the flies, because I've seen people, you know, stripping slow, letting it sink, some people doing it a little bit quicker, and I know when I'm working plugs, most of the time, I'm trying to be fast and aggressive, because I'm trying to get that reaction strike out of them, yeah, and exactly. I've also had some people on my boat, you know, I get people to come out and ask me if, if I do fly fishing, I'm like, I don't. I, I can't coach you up on it because that's not my forte. I'll send him with Mike, my other captain. Um, but I'm like, I can put you where the fish are. We can go from there. And uh, so I end up learning a lot from them, just watching them go through it. And, uh, you know, some of the things were kind of were kind of counterintuitive from what I've, like, always thought, you know, the way they were fishing. Like, they were fishing, like, against the tide and t type of stuff to get the thing to sink right. So I thought that was a little strange. Or just different, not strange. But um, my other question for you as a lore maker, what are your thoughts? Let's say, let's stick with stripers here. What are your thoughts on colors and the importance of color compared to size and profile? Uh, I, I I mean, I, I'm pretty standard on my colors. My favorite colors are olive and chachoose, mm -hmm. you know, and white. Um, that, or in, in black at night. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, fishing up in Joppa, I really like, you know, your darker colors. Uh, and olive is phenomenal up in Joppa. And the key about when you're tying your own flies now, when it comes to, or, or any flies that you select, is Joppa likes anything with a grizzly pattern in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so not, what's a grizzly pattern? Like stripes? Okay. Yeah, stripes. Okay. Okay. Uh, what I can do, I can start showing you some flies. If yes, that helps. please. That'd be great. That'd okay, be great. Just, yeah, just give me a second. I'm going to get some flies, okay? Example of one right here. Okay, can you see? See the lead eye right here? See yeah, hold it like up just a little bit tighter. There you go. Yeah, we got okay. it. Okay. Yep. And this would be the the front part is your clouser part with the lead eyes in the front. Yeah. And then the back end is the feathers. You notice how we got that grizzly feather in there, those lines. Mm-hmm. They love that stuff there. And some of the stuff that I've developed over the years is uh, a fly that's called the striper dragon. All right. Ooh. Now that's a deer hair body, deer hair belly body a little bit of grizzly feathers in there and that's just been absolute killer i tied that in a bunch of different colors uh here's one right here too that's great when you're up in the uh up in the back end of uh joppa uh, over by woodbridge mm -hmm. well all those weeds and stuff there yeah that, right in the marsh yeah right in the marsh that's a great cat in there uh and then you know when you get out in a little bit open water you know, and you want something to uh, show up, like out by the mouth, out in front of Salisbury, or down uh, down in front of Plum Island, all the way down to the uh, the uh, Emerson. Yeah. This is what I'm going to start throwing there. That's another half and half. 
Klaus Siva type fly. Can you hold it up a little bit for the camera? Just straight up. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Nice. You can see the lead eye there. A little bit of pink, a little bit of lemon in the back. Pink and, that's yeah, just, pink and lemon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a great pattern down there, too. So that's a little bit of what I'm – and and I'm always – when I fish the beach, too, uh, I'm always fishing a sinking line. I use a 350 line, and I'm always uh, using lead. Lead eye type flies, either clouses or uh, cloud sievers or, or whatever, because I want to get that fly down into the you know, almost into the sand. Mm -hmm. I wanted I want it looking like a sand eel. I think uh, yeah, a lot of people don't even realize like right in front of the beach how shallow those fish will be, and just mudding around the bottom looking for sand eels and anything crabs something like that. Oh yeah, beach. yeah, they just root right all in there. Yeah, they they really do. It's uh, it's amazing, especially uh, a lot. I, I fish a lot down the Sandy Point, mm -hmm. and you actually can sight fish. You got yeah, maybe the water's 45... super clear down there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got maybe forty five minutes to do this here now, but you can. You know how uh, the sandbar runs all the way up to uh, the uh, the spindle out there. Yep. You can actually wade that, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, on a. Uh, on uh, an incoming tide, like, you know, you got that part where it's still dead low to just about when it starts to turn and starts coming in, you can see those fish come right up on those flats. Oh, and yeah. It's some, uh, it's some phenomenal fishing, let me tell you, because the water's so clear. But you don't have that much time. you got to get out of there quick. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and it fills in really quick that, down there, too. Yeah. Like, yeah, one, yeah. One, all of a sudden, that current is ripping, and, and it's up, like, three, four feet than it was, like, your last drift or two. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, well, be out there in the water. This is one of my favorite paths right down, right here down the Joppa Flats. So yeah. what do you call okay. that one, Joe? It's still a striper dragon. Okay. okay. It's, it's got the deer hair body, deer hair head. That's all trim, deer yeah. butt, belly fur. And it's got the little bit of grizzly in the back. And I'm telling you, these flies here have caught so many 40-inch-plus fish. Oh. No kidding. That little thing, huh? That, that little thing, I'm telling you. You see them because on an outgoing tide, the water's still pretty murky, so yep. it's gold. Yep. So when you so so when you see a big you know fish come up, all you're seeing is that gold belly coming up and sucking that fly down. Yeah. Oh, it's just it's it's pretty amazing to see that kind of stuff. Have you ever had days on Joppa where you can see the fish? I know there was a couple of years ago. There was like maybe about a week and a half straight. It'd be, it be it would even be like midday. You'd be on the flats because you knew there were fish there. And even if we had live bait, mackerel, or pogies, like we could probably get them all kind of wrapped up on the pogies a little bit. But I would stand up on my <laughs> bow and like they would almost be under the boat, Joe. Like I could re take a yeah, stick yeah, and yeah. poke them. Like nothing bothered them, but man, I we couldn't get a bite until we started fishing like six inch sluggos, real yeah. slow. Well, let me tell you something, okay? Uh, they don't bite until they just don't. Uh, they, no, no, no. You got high tide, right? Yeah. Two after two hours after high tide up on Joppa, when you're out in the boat, that's when yeah. you start. Mm -hmm. You go up during it and coming, you'll see fish everywhere. Yeah. You know, you'll spook fish everywhere. And then a lot of times the ospreys will tell you exactly where the fish are. Because mm -hmm. you'll hear them up there squawking all over the place. And there's even been some years where somebody uh, uh, will, will attach a barber to a fish. Mm -hmm. So you can actually follow the school. No that because it's dragging a it's dragging a barber around. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, it, it's crazy stuff. It really is, but I tell you, that was two hours after that uh, after that high tide, man. That water got the piss through there, and uh, you can just you know you can just see the bass. Yeah, huh. I mean they really turn on, really it's turn a, on. It's a lot of fun, an ideal situation for the fly too. God, yeah, yeah. I mean, and and, and you start right off at the old stink pipe, okay? Mm -hmm. That's you know way up by the sail sailboats, and that's where you want to start, right in that area there after that two hour period. And then uh, when you first get there, though, you know, you probably would mosey around Wood Woodbridge and just, just see if there's any fish out there. And you'll usually spook some fish. But, you know, you might catch one or two, but chances are that you won't. But I tell you, once that tide turns and you go up by uh, by the stink pipe and those sailboats, uh, it, can get, it can get pretty pretty wild. And if you think about it and you relate it to fishing just in general, 
you know, the spot that you're talking about. It's adjacent to um, a huge rock pile, a deep channel, a yep. sink, uh, the pipe, the the underwater uh, pipe there, and then yep. the edge of the flats, right? Yep. You get the yeah. outgoing tide, the current's moving, so it's a feeding station. Every It's a choke point. All these different things are kind of converging in one area where bait's going to be washed around. The bass can stage in the current. They can ambush, so it's like... It makes sense that that area would be a hot spot at that time, you know, if you yeah. put in all the factors and all the and all the environmental um, geography of the situation. Yeah, I mean, you got hot tide rocks, you got, you know, the, the stink pipe, and, you know, like you, you said. You the moorings, the boats. Yeah, the moorings, everything. They just, they love that area. They really do. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. All right, so. You like you like those little um, cloud seavers. You like yep. the 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 tiger stripe with the green and the white. Yeah, okay. striper dragons. Yep, striper dragons. Yep. Yep. All right, all right. What's the biggest fish you've ever caught? The biggest striper you've ever gotten a fly? It was with actually with Al Montello. I don't know if you guys have heard of Al Montello. I know Skip. I haven't met Al. Yeah. Oh, okay. Al is like the guru. Uh, he's probably one of the best fishermen you'll ever fish with down uh, in that area. Yeah. Uh, He's just phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Well, him and I went out, and we're fishing Joppa, and uh, my biggest bass, we, I mean, I mean, what an incredible day that was. I still got pictures of it. I, I'll actually show you a picture in a couple of minutes. Oh, please do. But uh, uh, it was 42 inches on, on the fly, oh. and uh, he was, you know, he's, he's holding up one right alongside me. It's 46. Oh, my God. And this is all up in Joppa. I, I got to show you the pictures. Hold on. Give, give me a second. Uh, yeah, please do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think we caught probably around 12 keepers that day. Yeah. Oh, what a day. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Look at that All slob. like that there. All like that there. It's just, it was incredible. Ah. Oh. You know? Yeah, and looks like you're kind of right on that edge there, like fishing yeah, exactly. from that pipe, yeah. like floating yeah. out. Yeah. Do you want me yeah. to block out all this here? I will. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. No, yeah. don't worry. It's on everybody yeah, else's face. <laughs> it looks like it was yeah. quite some time ago. Yeah. All those fish are yeah, gone now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what but, were you uh, on for a boat there? Was that like a Boston whaler or something? No, that was, uh, oh, God. Actually, that was, uh, that boat there, I don't even remember what it was, but it was Mo Flaherty's boat down the vineyard. So I've, I've actually fished out of that boat many times. And then <clears> Al, uh, Al bought it from, uh, 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 Mo Flaherty. Oh, it's like, cool. it looks like a great setup for fly fishing. Like oh, nice yeah. low rail. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, nothing above you. Yeah, and railings are important. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something, something that you can put your knee on or something. Uh, because you get super excited casting that fly rod. Now, do you primarily fly fish from a boat or from shore? Both. Both. Both? Do, do you have a, a boat yeah. or do you just? No. You go I on other a, people's good deal. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, the, I'm, I'm a, I'm a uh, boat whore. No problem. Oh, there we down with OPB, <laughs> other people's boats. <laughs> people's boats, yeah. The way to but, go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I do have a Hobie kayak. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah the Pro Angler. Uh, I love that. That's just phenomenal. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm too scared to take it out by Joppa, though, because I know how Joppa can get. But uh, I take it down the Cape with me all the time, you know, fishing the ponds out, out in the Cape, uh, especially on a worm hatch. You guys yeah, want to talk about fishing? Let's talk I about. I wish it. we had a. I, I wish we had a worm hatch out here, up in this area here. Like, like isn't the there sometimes one a little one like around June? I've heard, but I've never fished it. I've there never has to be. seen it. Yeah, yeah, there has yeah. to be. There has to be. But I'm telling you that uh, worm hatch, the cinder worm hatch. Uh, if you go on my. Uh, I think it's on my Facebook page. I actually have pictures of me out in my kayak, and I'm taking videos of all the uh, worms coming up alongside the boat. And oh, they're no only, kidding. you know, they're only this big here, but there's tens of thousands of them everywhere you look, and the bass are on them. They're crashing them like crazy. I mean, any a bass from you know, you know, 16 inches all the way up to you know, 40 inch long, feeding on these little tiny cinder worms. It's just incredible. And as a fly huh. fisherman, what a perfect situation that is, right? It is. It is because you, it, it's super, super easy, okay? You, you use a floating line. You don't have to use all those, you know, intermediates or uh, uh, shooting head type lines. You just use a floating line, uh, little small cinder worm fly, which are they're on my website. You know, uh, 
So they're only two to three inches long, size two lot. I mean, uh, no, size two to uh, six hooks. Mm-hmm. And last year was incredible. I actually, I'm only using a size uh, size four hook, and uh, I couldn't stop some of the fish. I had fish straight out my hooks. No kidding! Wow. Yeah, yeah, and this is all off off the shore, not in a boat. Okay, fishing from the shore, and uh, you fish, you know. And you see worms everywhere. I mean, it, the, the place turns red, red no and kidding. black with, with, with cinder worms. And it's just, it's the ultimate. It's so the how ultimate. Do you, how I do can you do that all day long. How do you stand out to get a bite? Is this a match the hatch situation? Or do you Absolutely try to make it a little it. bit bigger, different color, just a smidge different to make it stand out and all that stuff? Uh, I've got a few tricks that I've tried that seems to work a little bit better. Like I, I've gone to the octopus style hooks, red hooks. Red and it seems, yeah, it seemed to work better because it's, you know, when you see the uh, the cinder worms, they're doing all little squiggly things that are going all over the place, you know, yeah. like that there. It's exactly what they look like in the water. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's a fast strip, sometimes it's a super slow strip. Uh, but when they're su- feeding super, super heavy, uh, it gets hard, hard fishing. But when the, when the worm hatch first starts and when it's almost over, the fishing can be incredible. Absolutely incredible. Oh, that's really neat. I'd like to experience that sometime. Oh, yeah, definitely. I tell you, you haven't you haven't fished a fly rod until you fished a worm hatch. And you're mostly going down towards the Cape for that type yeah. of fishing? Yeah, yeah. It's all the Cape because they got the you know, the slow waters, you know, you fish all the back ponds. Yeah. Uh, I'm always blindfolded folded when people take me there. So. <laughs> and uh, don't worry, we weren't going to ask that much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, some it things is, can't so. be held sacred. What What about <sighs> Albies? You must be Albie fishing. Oh God, my dog. Okay, I guess my dog's name is Albie. Uh, Albie, you got it. <laughs> is that Is that him in the back behind your cor- behind oh, your those, shoulder? Oh, no, yeah, those are some of my older dogs. Uh, yeah, I have I have my Hannah, and she was you know she was pretty famous down at Plum Island. She was my fishing partner, my yeah. golden. Uh, and she was just, she was the best fishing partner anybody could have. I mean, uh, I had her for 15 years, and, you know, uh, I don't know if you guys remember Frenchie down at, uh, down at Captain's Lady. He worked in the shop there. I think that was, that must have been before I started yeah. working there. Yeah, yeah. He, he absolutely loved Hannah. You know how, how, how down there, the uh, when it gets super low tide and the ramp going to Captain's, okay, gets to be like this? Yeah, you know, on a super low tide. Well, I'm fishing over by the docks, and Hannah wanted to come out and see me. And she runs down the uh, the uh, the pier there, and uh, she wants to get at me. But she's looking down and says, "I ain't going down there." So Frenchie was watching her, and next thing you know, Hannah just turns right around and went down backwards on that ramp just to come down and see me. <laughs> That's a long way to go, too. <laughs> she oh, went back, was all the way down, and then you know she came up and see me. I mean, she used to scare the hell out of me because she would jump in that river. Oh, jeez. And oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know, during uh, you know last hour of the outgoing tide, she jump in that river right at Captain's Lady, and she would just swim all the way down, either to the uh, point if the, if the sandbar was there, come back and do it again, or she end up down by the jetties. Oh my god. She was god. just nuts. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she was just nuts. She loved the water. Good fishing partner. I'd be having my fly line all over the place. You know, if she would get tangled in the fly line, she knew to pick up her back legs and get out of it. Uh, anybody catching fish, you'd have to see everybody's fish go right down the line. <laughs> but, uh, oh, yeah, she was, she, was, she was famous down there. Even people now says, oh, yeah, I remember you. You're the guy with the golden retriever. I says, yeah, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Everybody remembers the dog. Yeah. Uh, everybody remembers the dog. Yeah, yeah. She was she was a good girl. Oh, and, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, my other two dogs were Wheaton, Wheatons. They weren't really big on the water. And I have another dog right now. She's a she's a Wheaton also. She's just she loves going down the beach with me. Oh my god! But uh, she doesn't like to swim. She likes to keep you know right at uh, you know ankle length. <laughs> yeah. ankle, ankle depth in the water, yeah. you know, but she loves it, though. Growing up, we actually had a Wheaton. I was going to ask you if that was a Wheaton. Oh, okay. Mine's, oh, yeah. yeah. Same yeah. thing. He didn't like the water too much. Yeah. But and they like the water, but he doesn't like to swim in it, you know. Yeah. He'll, she'll, she'll, she'll stay right along the edge the whole time and dig up a bunch of holes and, you know, have fun, chase the birds. But she doesn't like to swim. Not like Hannah. Hannah was a good girl. Good, good yeah. fishing partner. My best fishing partner ever. 
<laughs> and she was never on a leash back then. Never on a leash. Oh no! Oh, yeah, dogs could do. You know? yep. Yeah, it was. She was just great. And like I said, everybody knew her. You know, uh, the old the old crew of uh, old timers down there. You all knew Hannah. We need to get a little dog for the boat. How's Kona? Oh, Kona's best. pretty good. On the boat. I love bringing my my dog is the best fishing partner ever. She really oh. is. Like she's just such a good. I bring her on the boat. She just like sits there and wants me to catch fish. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> She's awesome. Oh, it's funny when the mackerel out. come on the boat, she tries to eat them. It's like, okay, <laughs> like, let's not eat these things. There was one time she did get into one. She literally ate a whole mackerel. That oh, made for God. an interesting evening. And I'll tell <laughs> yeah. you that. Uh, but it's a, it's a lot of fun. Like having the dog as your partner is just the best. It really is the best. Well, well, Albie now, my new dog, she comes out in the kayak with me all the time. She'll, she'll sit in the back and she'll have a ball. And, you know, oh, she's they're not small dogs to weep. I mean, you know, you know, she's thirty-five pounds, so it's not like you know she's a tiny little dog. She'll sit in the back of my kayak, and you know, she loves it when I catch fish. She's gonna look at them all, and then she's back doing her own thing again. Yeah, a lot of fun. Lot yeah, of, my lot dog's of fun. the same way. He likes to check out the fish, see what's going on. Yeah, maybe exactly. gives him a li- couple licks. <laughs> my, my parents' dog, they go lobster and, and they like they put they'll ban the lobster and put him on the deck and let Mako his name is Mako let Mako play with him and, and he'll lick the lobster. <laughs> yeah. He'll oh, stare it funny. down, you know, like get down low and crouch and just stare at it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> first one playing the game of chicken. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're they're, uh, they're a lot of fun, you know. All right, so let me ask you a question. That's awesome. That, Thank you for sharing those stories with your dog. That was that that was great. <laughs> that was really like made me happy. So let's go over what started that conversation. I'll be fishing. You Albie's, must love oh it. That god. must be something on a fly. Oh my god. I, I got my first back when I first started fishing for those, it was all Benita. There was no Albies fishing yeah. in the cave in the vineyard. Uh I'll never forget my first one. I was fishing with actually with Captain Freddie and uh he had a, a like a twenty six foot dusky. You know, it was it was a boat That's built right. for, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it was a boat built boat built for uh, you know fishing, you know Devil's Bridge and all that area there. You know, it's it's a good boat. But uh, I'm, we're fishing over at uh, Hedge Fence, and the water was really ripping through there. And man, I hooked my first algae. I thought I had the bottom, I, and then all of a sudden the line just peels right off. Uh, Benita. Yeah. And uh. Actually, my first one I ever caught was eight pounds. Benita, first Benita? Is, yeah, eight pounds. Well, that's a big thing was boy. <laughs> it was huge, right off the right, right off the fence. It was incredible, and uh, it's just a little sand eel pattern that, uh, you know, down there it's all sand eels and uh, and silver sides mm-hmm. in that area there. You know, you get further down south. Actually, we actually saw a lot of uh, of uh, bay anchovies too this year. Normally, you see all the bay anchovies down uh, down on Rhode Island. Yeah. Uh, or, or if you get around the uh, the vineyard, you'll see them, uh, you know, out by Cape Pogue area, out by Cape Pogue Lighthouse. You yeah. see a lot of bay anchovies out there, but mostly in between, uh, you know, uh, the vineyard and the Cape is, I, you know, it's either the baby bunker. Yeah, we were in Falmouth this uh, year, and there was the there was the uh, peanut bunker everywhere. Peanut bunker, everywhere. yep. Everywhere, or it's the uh, sand eels, uh, or the uh, uh, silver sides. You see a lot of silver sides. Mm-hmm. Especially, you see a lot of silver sides over on the capes on the uh, vineyard side, over by Oaks Bluff and stuff. And uh, you know, uh, Oaks Bluff. Uh, I've done a lot off the Lobster Little Beach, uh, Dogfish Bar, all that area there. A lot, a lot of shore fishing along that area there. Uh, I was actually down at uh, that down a lot down at Cape Pogue, uh, Cape Pogue Gut last year. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was some fun fishing down there. Couldn't hook anything up, man. It was just too freaking windy, man. But those fish were coming within inches of me. It's like every time I had to go to the bathroom, guess where the fish were? Oh, they right popped right on the steamboat. Yeah, yeah, right where I was standing every time. It was it's crazy. It's like but, they uh, know, right? Yeah, yeah. But I actually had a really good algae fishing uh, season last year. Uh, I was fishing with uh, one guy out in his boat, and he was using one of those uh, Chachus, uh, al- what are they called, Albi, uh, I don't know. Albi, uh, Haboxy jigs? So, something uh, like Albi that, snacks? Yeah. Albi, Albi snacks, snacks. Yeah. 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 Albi yeah. snacks, yeah. And uh, he was using a Chachus color. Now, I was trying everything else in my boat, in my in my box, you know, the natural, you know, silver side or little baby bunkers, you know, bunny flies and all that stuff there. Finally, 
you know, I, I looked at his uh, Albi snack and he had Chachus on it. So I put on a, a, a Chachus epoxy. I can show you a picture of one. I can show you an actual one here. I have them somewhere. But uh, boom, first cast. And the thing about Al Albies, okay, you got to lead into them. You mm -hmm. can't cast behind them. You can't cast in the middle of them. You have mm -hmm. to lead into them. And it's hard, especially on a fly rod. Spinner rod, you know, all you do is chuck it, chuck it and reel in like crazy, you know. But with a, with, with a fly rod, you really have to lead into them. You have to kind of figure out, you know, you watch them pop and pop and pop them. And you have to cast in front of them. And I, I don't use a, a, an intermediate line like a lot of guys do. I'll actually use a, uh, a sink tip 250 line because that will actually get down a little bit, uh, a little bit further. And it's easy to cast instead of, you know, back false casting two or three times to try to get the uh, line out there. It's just bring it back once and chuck it, chuck it and duck it. Yeah, the weight, the weight yeah. of it will pull it out a little bit further, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And uh, and you must have to strip thing, at ridiculous speeds to get that thing going. Because I get tired see, just the way I'm reeling in. Yeah, no kidding. See, and that's the thing that uh, I've learned over the years of over, you know, 20 years of Albi and Bonita, and Bonita fishing is that you don't strip fast. Really? You fish slow and steady. Like, I'm going like this here. Just like no. that there. Nice, steady retrieve. They can't turn on a fly like a bass can. That's true. So so the, the longer you keep it in the strike zone, the better. But I see this, the spin guys, they'll, they'll, they'll just, you know, they'll reel in as quickly as possible. And they hook up. But I try doing it, I never hook up. I have always done it slow and steady. I wonder I've gotten hundreds. I wonder if it's because the fly is like a little more buoyant than like a like the jigs people are fishing. Because when I fish, when I throw an Albi snack as opposed to some of the epoxy jigs, I'll fish the Albi snack slow. I'll let it sink and I'll twitch it and fish that slower a lot of the time than I do if I do the epoxy jig. So I wonder if that's like having a fly that's not sinking down to the bottom like a jig would, you know? Yeah. And being able to keep it in that strike zone where they can see it a little bit longer. Allows for that slow retrieve too. Yeah, but that was I, a great point you mentioned about them not being able to turn quick. So by yeah. fishing it slow, they see it longer and they can go straight for it, yep. as opposed to you know having a have a whiz by their head when they go in one direction. They get a turn. And yeah, exactly. It. And like I said, you have to lead into them. You know, yeah. uh, if you if, if you can get that one cast lead into the fish, you know you got a you know a ninety nine percent chance of hooking up. Mm hmm. And, and another thing I noticed uh, past couple of years is that I tie uh, a lot of, you know, epoxy flies that are uh, natural, you know, natural bucktails or whatever. I'm actually noticing that when I use the synthetic materials, it seemed to work a lot better. Interesting. Yeah, I, 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 I can't figure it out, but uh, the materials out there is like, you know, and, uh, here, let, let me show you a couple examples, okay? Yeah, see. please. Okay, now... These are your natural type uh, of uh, epoxy flies, okay? Like this one right here is a little mummy chug. Okay, yeah. Great, great, oh, yeah. great, great okay. bass fly, okay? It's got the epoxy, uh, epoxy head, and it's got all the feathers in the back. Okay, now this is a great, great striper fly. So when you make that, are you putting it? Are you turning it somehow? And then yeah, how does yeah? Okay. Oh yeah, I have a rotisserie, and I turn it in the rotisserie, or I'm using a UV resin. Now my vice are all rotary vices, so okay. uh, I can turn it, turn the fly in my vice to get that nice smooth body. Yeah, nice. But uh, some of the flies that I was using, like. You know, a simple white fly, which is usually a, a killer on um, Albies and Benita. I was throwing this sucker here. wasn't doing anything. They wouldn't even look at it. As can see that, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. And then, once I went to the synthetics, now this is all synthetic material right here. Hmm. They just like that so much better. I don't. I don't know why. Interesting. And what's well, nice it definitely about, looks like it, it can have a thinner profile, maybe. It, it, the profile is the same. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I just can't I wonder what it, it looks out. like under the water. Yeah, it looks like it's yeah. got a little more, like, natural yeah. flash on it. 
Well, even that, just the consistency of the, yeah. uh, it looks yeah. a little, uh, it actually looks a little more coarse, like a little stiffer. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 they don't like the action. Yeah, it is. It, it, it's, it, it's, it has no action. It's just like a yeah. stick date. Yeah. yeah. You know? But, uh, and what's nice about, when, when you're using synthetics, though, what's not really nice about this here is that you can trim it on the boat. If, 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 if you've got snot out there, they're feeding on snot, you know, you can trim this down to, you know, something like that there without a problem. Yep. Why couldn't you do it with natural material? Uh, because you don't want to wreck it. Because now you're going to end up with, you know, with tapered ends. You see how, gotcha. how the, all this is tapered? Yep. And it's, yep. It, it, for me, as a fly tire, uh, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. But I know guides, especially down in Florida, uh, if they if, if they were fishing something like this down in Florida, and they don't, this is too long for them. They take the scissors and they they cut that right off in a second. Yeah, you know they want to be fishing with stuff like that. <laughs> Up here, so, go ahead. I saw. I don't know. You remember the show, um, the Spanish Fly? Oh yeah, Jose Wahebe. Jose Wahebe. Yeah. I remember he was fishing down at the Cape with Terry Terry Nugent. This is when I was like in high school. So, and they were fishing a bass feed of all these huge stripers, like bang in the boat. And he couldn't get a bite. They were on krill, right? And he he, he wanted to. He never got a striper on the fly, so they broke down and they they took one of his flies. And he was talking about cutting it, and he started cutting it, you know, a little bit shorter to match the krill. And he wanted it just a little bit bigger. In his first cast, he caught like a forty-seven incher <laughs> yeah. on the fly with that with that bait. Yeah. So yeah. It's really cool, really cool, yeah. like adaptation, you know, being yeah. out in the water and making a change. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, fishing that snot. <laughs> <laughs> See a lot of that, but uh, Albies, though, I mean, they're just an incredible fishery. Uh, thank God we can't keep them. You know? Yeah, no kidding, right? Thank God for that. There, Benita, a different story, though. <laughs> they're tasty. They're, oh yeah, they're good eating. They're real good eating. I don't even eat fish, but I like Benito. 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 Benito is good. It is. Actually, I think the DMF or somebody just did an uh, Albi tagging study this past fall. Yeah, I saw that. I didn't really get involved with it, but I I saw that, which is which is good. I don't know. I don't know much about it other than they did it. So hopefully, uh, maybe <laughs> Matt Air might be able to shed some light on it. We have in a couple of weeks. That would be nice. Yeah, that would definitely be interesting because they're definitely not a, a, a fish that's studied often, you know, not like your tuna yeah. or your stripers. Yeah. So it would be cool to get some data on that. Oh, and uh, this fly right here, this is I caught my first albi on that. Yeah, my oh, first that's a good-looking fly. Yeah, yeah. And all that is is, you know, peacock curl and some uh, bucktail underneath. Yeah, it's got those nice olive-like tones to it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Curl body. I saw a lot of these still, even to this day. It's such a it's such a great fly. What's the number one fly that you sell? What is, what's like the most popular coming out from your booth? Oh, striper dragons. Uh, striper dragons. Actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no question about that. Striper dragons, and uh, next would be probably squid flies. Yeah. So for so a lot of guys of, down the Cape, Rhode Island uh, area, everywhere. You know, yeah. it's amazing. You know. People will say, oh, there's no squid up around here. I says, yes, there is. Oh, there I is. Says, I said, all you're going to need to do is throw out it. I'm telling you, the bass will come out of nowhere to hit a squid fly. They really will. Do you it's, have a squid fly you can show us? Yeah, absolutely. I just noticed your chair, by the way. That thing's awesome. <laughs> you see the flies on Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> A bunch of flies. Yeah. Now this is this is a. Uh, I like tie a super super simple squid fly. Yeah, I don't tie anything really fancy, but uh, that's that's it right there. Oh, there you go. Okay. That's really cool. You know, and it's made. You can see the uh, how the feathers are all splayed the back. Yeah. Oh, that's really neat. And I tie this in uh, a bunch of different colors. Uh, a natural, you know, uh, tan type squid, mm -hmm. uh, pink, and uh, what's a really huge color down the vineyard is that peach color. They love that there. Oh yeah, it's almost like the pink stinger. Yeah, yep. 
it, yeah, this is one of my my favorite my my favorite flies down there. It's the, like I said, it's the uh, uh, Joppa Flat Special. This is actually uh, a fly that you can fly on online on to learning how to tie it. Just put in striper fly, and it should come up my name, and it should come up. But that's all your grizzly saddles in the back, olive olive top, a little bit of peacock curl, and uh, a big huge epoxy head that you know I make out, I make myself out of uh, either UV resins or uh, epoxy, and always use thirty minute epoxy if you're going to use epoxy. It's just a lot stronger. Okay, as opposed, is there like a quick epoxy? Or is that quick yeah, or is that minute, long? Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah that, right. that's a long setting. Don't use the five minute because it's junk. All it's going to do is yell on you and look like crap. Yeah. Uh, and this stuff here is hot as a rock. It's just it's just such good stuff. And that, like I says, I've caught so many big fish on that. Really What's that, bad. about five, six inches total yeah. length or so? Yeah, a, a little over six inches. It can go up to seven inches. Yeah. You know, and uh, tied on a big uh, four-odd hook. I hope you guys can see the hook there. Yeah. What brands are you going with with your hooks? Do you have a particular favorite? Uh, hooks can be so. I like to be honest with you. I like the stainless steel hooks. I can sharpen. Yeah. Most of your uh, uh, chemically sharpened hooks, you can't sharpen. Mm-hmm. Get rid of the coating. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, like, I, I still like this is tied on an Eagle Claw two fifty four SS, which is one of my standards. I still like the muscle hooks. I use uh, Gami's. Kamigatsu's, I use Dairikis, Daihichi's. Uh, I use a lot. I'm, I'm even starting to try out the uh, Arex hooks. I don't know if you guys have heard of the Arex. Arex, no, I haven't. Yeah, yeah, they're uh, they're a hook made over overseas in Denmark, and uh, they're really a nice hook. Uh, they got the Blue Water series, mm-hmm. and it's it's a nice hook. It's super strong, you know, uh, for your your biggest species of fish. Uh, that's something. Uh, I'm gonna really start looking into. I just started tying them, tying with them recently, and I like them so far. Good. Oh, here's yeah. one of those little snot flies I was telling tell, telling you about. Oh, look at that. <laughs> so that's when they're just on tiny little bait, and they ain't yeah, eat anything yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that material in the back is that old fish here that I was telling you about before. Yeah. You know that's been around forever. That's this fish here in the back, all synthetic. And uh, sometimes I'll even put a little brown spot there, make it look like you know. Uh, but my uh, my my a, my A H flies, I call it A H. The asshole yeah. flies. <laughs> <You got it. laughs> I put a little brown spot right there. Well, think about it. if you were that small size fish coming out, you'd probably have a brown spot coming out there too. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, back to the squid flies, though. This is uh, one of my uh, my peach squids. Okay. Oh yeah, that, you that see color. that there? Yeah, they really like that color there. And here's uh, one of the uh, the tan ones I was telling you about, too. This is more of a natural. I, I've caught more albies and bananas spitting up squid, especially over the hedge bench down the vineyard, spitting them suckers right up. Yeah. Look at that. Oh, my God. I'd get lost trying to make, build, make that <laughs> thing. I have enough time it's, wrapping a guide on a rod. <laughs> it's actually, you know, it's actually really – they're really simple. I mean, you know uh, – uh, my my commercial tying, especially, I try to keep it, you know, uh, simple. The kiss method of tying, you know, keep it simple, yep. stupid. Uh, really, you don't need a lot of fancy stuff when you tie. Uh, I can, you know, most of the fish I caught when I was younger were well, just on, you know, a couple saddle hackles, a lead eye, and, and, and some uh, bucktail. And that's it, you know. Especially when you're fishing up at Plum Island. Uh, they really like that lead eye fly. They really do, especially when you're fishing off the shore. Does that help get the the? Does it just make the fly sit like nose down a little bit, or just makes yeah, it a little it, bit heavier? Yeah, it makes it a little bit heavier. And, and you're gonna, you know, you see sandals in the water when they're, you know, when they're on bait. They're they're doing this, they're doing that. There, and yeah. that's the same thing that the uh, the half and half do. You know, they're gonna. And oh, nothing I didn't mention to you guys. Okay. Uh, when we're talking about retrieving, yeah. Drop the flats, retrieve like a mad bit. Long with a little, you know, little, little bit at the end. Yeah. Long and fast and hard. Hard, hard, hard stripping 
all through, all through the Merrimack, you know, Salisbury Drift, Drop of Flats, I don't care where you are, up at the uh, Chain Bridge, strip hard. Okay. Strip hard. That's been I'll, my life I'll, model, you know, Joe. Strip hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're out by the, uh, you know, Salisbury out in front. I've got a lot of a lot of big fish out in that area, too. I love fishing that out. On, on, on either change of the tide, top or uh, bottom of the tide, you yep. go right out to the mouth. Yep. And you'll see you'll see the you'll see the fish working out there. Yeah, definitely in those spots, like you said, we talked about earlier, the changes of the yeah. tides when you start getting those back eddies on those situations. Yeah. And again, it's the yeah. same thing over there, like it is over at Captain's. If you're able to reach out, there's a there's a nice little, <laughs> little drop off, and they're all kind of running the edge of that that area. Now I've got notes over on the point, okay, where you actually had like three different sandbars you could uh, wait out to. This is going back probably the early, uh, early, uh, two, no, probably the 90s. But you could actually wait out to three different sandbars out by the point. No and kidding. It was friggin' awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, huh. you could actually cast to the uh, can out there. What is that? The four can? Uh, the, the seven can. can. Seven the red, can. The red you, one or the green one? The green one. Yeah, it's the seven you could can. Actually, you could actually cast out to the seven can. That's how close. You can wow. get out there, and it was just phenomenal fishing. Oh my God, those bass would stack up. Behind. It's like fishing down at Cranes Beach. You know how you got all the sandbars and yep. cranes, and and there's fish stacked up behind every sandbar. That's how mm-hmm. it was there. It was just incredible. You know, for a shore guide, you know, that's where I used to, you know, go and take clients and everything else. God, I was some good fishing back then. Really good fishing. Now it's so hard with the all the big guides, you know. You go there on a good tide, and you know there's there's a hundred people there, you know, uh, slinging clams. It's tough. So I find a lot of other spots that I can fish at, but not like those old days. So those that was good fishing. I can't wait for that to happen again. Well, hopefully soon, man. Yeah. Hopefully soon. Yeah. It seems yeah. like every year, the last five or six years has been getting a little bit better and better every year. So yeah. 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 Hopefully, we continue on that path. I mean, last year was good. Last year was a good one. Yep. Lots of action. We had a great spring last year, which was really nice in terms of bigger fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially off the beach too. A lot of a lot of big fish. I've also done a lot down at Sandy Point. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, you walk all the way down to where all the houseboats are. Mm-hmm. There's a beautiful mud flat down there, and I've done I've had some great fishing down there too. And, and it's easy to get out the deeper water because they'll, they'll come up on the uh, mud flat on the lower tide. Yeah, and uh, you know you can have some great, great fishing down there. I even caught in window pane like this. Yeah, you know, you caught a couple this window pane uh, on the fly. On the fly, <laughs> they're pretty the aggressive. Fly, yeah. They're pretty aggressive, yeah, they man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny you mentioned yeah. that because I think we caught like two or three this year. Believe it or not, I mean, they're like, they're like, yeah, they're like doormats. The window pane. <laughs> yeah, well. Back back then, you used to be able to drive the truck down there too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I know. They stopped doing and, that this year. That yeah. was wicked disappointing. Yeah. Hopefully, yeah, you get an opportunity. At, uh, yeah, well, this that is before again. the birds. Yeah, I used to get off, of, you know, get onto parking lot one, you know, and drive down the beach, and you know, stop here, stop there, see what's going on. Uh, I had my first big, big bluefish blitz right at uh, parking lot five, way back when, uh, off off the shore, all using, you know. Larson Orange Pencil Pop is gray day, and it was just phenomenal. Big, big fish. I took Man, like, I miss those <laughs> wide-open bluefish blitzes. I haven't seen one of oh, those. I mean, God. we had good blue fishing this year, but not like back then. Oh, not like God. back then, man. Ooh. I mean, I, I took my buddy with me, okay? He, he probably never got a – I don't think he caught, he caught a fish over, over two pounds, you know, a largemouth bass. I took him with me, and uh, like I said, we're fishing uh, – first we start out in front of surf land. And we were fishing uh, bait, and then we switched over uh, uh, fishing herring. We picked up a few bluefish there, and then uh, somebody said they were that they were racing the beach down at uh, parking lot five. So we went down to parking lot five. Oh my god, nothing but top water, you know, pencil poppers, fluorescent orange, and they're all alligators. They're all in mm-hmm. the eighteen pound range, you know. And my buddy never caught you know anything like that there. After about 45 minutes, he finally landed his fish. And all he did was threw the rod up in the sand and just laid down. <laughs> he says, I'm done for today. 
<laughs> those are those are killer killer fish. Those blues back then. Oh my god! I remember. Oh my god! We used to do it all the time. But the funniest thing that always that always made me like wonder when a blue fish blitz would happen. It'd be going crazy, 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 and then all of a sudden it would just stop all at once. Yeah, I know. And like uh, even I like know. blitzes yeah. that were like 50, 50 yards long, hundred yards long. Yeah. And you'd be wailing on them for an hour or two, and then it just stopped, and it was like nothing was ever there. It was so weird. I remember my first one of my first best days down at uh, Plum Island fishing for bluefish. Now, uh, the South Jetty, okay, the rule was you always had a nice section of beach to fish off of right before the, uh, the South Jetty, right there. Yep. Uh, the rule was always, you know, two hours after low tide, that's when, that's when the fish would come in. And I remember it was like a day in, uh, I think it was like in July, end of July. And uh, we had a northeast wind blowing, slight wind, nothing nothing big, you know. But uh, I remember Kay Moulton always saying, you know, northeast, northeast wind is the great wind for the bluefish, brings a bait in. Mm-hmm. So I went down there, I went down there, and uh, I said, I'll give it a shot. I went down there, and I'm telling you. This, these were the first bluefish of the season, and I'll never forget. I got twenty six bluefish off the beach, <laughs> right there, and it was it was just incredible. Did you throw your rod in the sand and go up and take a nap after? <laughs> no way, no way, no way, man. That's just like you know. And, and, and my favorite plug back then was a creek chub, silver creek chub. Oh yeah, I think and, I got a couple yeah, of those kicking around the box. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. Silver creek chub, and uh, God, that was so much fun. Ah, oh, ah! Oh, I love you know I I love you know popping a plug too for bass and 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 bluefish too you know I always I always had two rods with me so the old timers used to make fun of me all the time until I sat out fishing them with a fly rod. Well, you know you got to bring that new fresh young blood in. Got to let know what's up. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> well, well, we were the new kids. We were the new kids on the block. Me and uh, I don't know if you guys know John Donovan, uh, another stone kid. Uh, he was a couple years younger than me, but we were always out there. Yeah. Johnny Surrett, you know, all us young kids. We were always out there, always, always having fun. Well, it's really awesome to see throughout the years you've kept your passion alive. you got your own little business going. <laughs> You're teaching other people, you know, sharing your passion, coming out here, talking talking to us about it, and we really appreciate it. You know, um, so, Joe, we're about like an hour and 20 minutes into this right now, so... Um, just before we go, uh, what's coming up for you? It's what middle of February, beginning of February right now. What do you okay, get coming I'm up giving... for shows and classes? Anything you want to share with people so yeah, they can come sure. out and see I'll, you? I'll be at uh, Concord Outfitters this Wednesday, uh, giving a class there. Uh, my next my next big show though is not until uh, I'm going to Pennsylvania. Uh, okay. The uh, fly fishing show out in Pennsylvania, but right after that, there I'm doing the uh, RZA show down oh, we'll in Rhode see you Island. Down there. Yep, yep, we'll see yep, you there. Yep, yep, yep. I'll be doing that there, and right after that, there we got the Plum Island show. Mm-hmm. Be there I'll be too. There. Yep, and then uh, yeah, that's all pretty much in March. Uh, February, I got a lot of classes. I got another class uh, the 19th of February at the Evening Sun Fly Shop. Uh, yeah. that, that would be, uh, stuff, we, stuff we're going to go over is tying hollow flies. I want to show you the hollow flies here. Now this yeah. is the reverse tide that, that we talked about before. Okay. The parachute style. Okay. Yep. Okay. This is just a simpler version. It's a flash. T- uh, it, it's got the flash tail in the back. Okay. And, uh, it only has three reverse ties in there. So you got one, I don't know if you guys can see it. Yeah. Get one, one here. One in the middle and one at the head. A little bit of peacock curl. And uh, let me try to show you a little bit, uh, a fuller version of, of seven step. Okay, now this one here is a seven step. Okay, this has got a bunch of saddle hackles in the oh, back. Yeah. Okay. And it's got, I don't know if you can see it, but it's got seven different oh, yeah. layers yeah. of bucktail in there. All tied reverse, you know, parachute style, all the way through. And that fly there, you know, you can probably see it right there. You know, yeah. there we go. That's about That's a big boy. Yeah. 
And I'm telling you, the big bass, oh, my God, the guides that I tied this floor for, they were, they, they're shooting me pictures of, you know, these 30, 40-pound bass all, you know, with the fly hanging out of its mouth and, you know, thanking me for tying, you know, tying, tying those flies for them. But here's another one, too, a little bit of grizzly in there. Yeah. Same thing. Those look and like good, like, pogey uh, imitators or even yeah, big yeah, herring. Exactly. Yeah. So given yeah. the time that goes into those, Joe, like, what does a fly like that retail for? Oh, it retails for twenty five dollars. Oh, okay. Which you know, if you think about it, it's really not that bad. No, yeah, not at all. No, I mean, you know, you, you guys think it's just here. We guys work for twenty five dollars an hour. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, oh, uh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah that's that, that's a nice black one there. But, so you, you mentioned know, earlier, actually, before we go, you mentioned earlier you do uh, dark colors for night. A lot of guys fly fishing at night. Oh God, yeah. Really. Oh, you, you, especially that 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 pre dawn dawn light. Okay? Yeah, I can see that. I mean, yeah. that is just phenomenal. And I used to do a lot of night fishing, you know, uh, especially off the beach. A lot of night fishing. Use the black, the black striper dragons. Let me let me show you that there. I have that right here too. Oh, here's here's a great night fly right here. There you go. That's not a striper dragon. That's my lazy dog, Flatwing. Yeah. It's got a couple feathers that are tied flat on top. Okay. And a little bit of uh, of uh, marabou. And that's a great night fly right there. And that's actually tied on that A-Rex hook. Okay. That's when you were talking hook. about. Yeah. 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 Blue water series. It's a nice hook. Yeah. It looks, you know, sharp. It looks a little more polished than the other ones. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not uh, something that uh, it, 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 you, you're doing the same thing where, where it's hard to shopping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, once, once you hit a rock or whatever, you know, you're pretty much done. And here's that black strap we're dragging that I'm telling you about. It's, oh, there you it's go. killer. Killer, killer, killer. Well, that's cool. Like yeah. The big eye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, and, and eyes. I, I think eyes are important on a fly. Yeah. You know, uh, my experience is, if I lose an eye, the uh, effectiveness of the fly does drop a little bit. When I do lose an eye, I take the other one off. It just seems to uh, work better. Yeah. So either you have eyes on it, or you have no eyes on it. Correct. You never have just one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. That's good advice. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I got so many freaking patents. I mean, I could, I, I could just spend three hours just going over the patents and, and where to fish them and how to fish them and everything else. But Do you, uh, do you ever talk about, I know you have your fly tying classes. Do you ever do, like, um, fly seminars talking about how to fish your flies? No, I've never done that before. Ooh. Never, ever. <laughs> That'd be cool because I would, I would, yeah. I would love to hear. I'm sure there's tons of people that would love to hear that aspect of it too, you know. Because I get a lot of people asking us yeah. like how how we fish lures and how we troll and stuff like that. Okay. And when somebody, well, 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 I'm sorry. Go ahead. When somebody's as knowledgeable as you and you're the creator, you know, if you can go <laughs> and like give a little spiel about your big flies and how to fish them, you know, that'd be really neat. Yeah, yeah. Well, I when I do teach, I do you know explain how to fish them too. Yeah, yeah, so, absolutely, cool. And uh, I'm working on you know more more uh, club dates because the clubs seem to really like like you know uh, me tying in front of them. And yep. when I do do that, there I really like to explain to them how to fish these flies. That works out really well. Great. It's, it, I'm getting better and better at that. Awesome, awesome, man. Well. Joe, thanks a lot, man. I really appreciate it. I learned a lot today. That was really, really cool. Yeah, it's impressive to see your work. I, 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 I think it's amazing. You're it's an amazing. artist, man. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's art. Uh, it, it's, it's a lot of fun, though, too. It's very relaxing, especially being retired. Yeah, I'm kind of jealous, it. too, I, I, the way you get to travel I, around, go to these shows. <laughs> Can I retire? Years. I want to Seriously, retire. <laughs> just hang out in the fishing community. It's such a, it's a great, great gig. 40, 40 years of doing this here. You know, How many uh, flies do you think you've sold in your lifetime? Oh, God, tens of thousands. You know, I'm also a, a designer for uh, one of the fly tying groups called Pacific Fly. Okay. Group, and uh, the Striper Dragons, some of the uh, deceivers that I tie. I mean, they're tied and sold all over the world. 
So no kidding. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. I, I, I'm pretty happy with that there. Actually, you guys know Stu App, right? I know the name. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean he's the you know, he's he he's the the top and king down in yeah. uh, Florida. Uh, actually, when I was working for American Angling Supplies with Dave Bashara, uh, he was best friends with Stu. And uh, I mean, this guy, you know, he taught Andy Mills, he taught uh, uh, Ted Williams, he taught everybody how to how to fly fish for top and on the hills. He owns more world records than you could possibly think of. And uh, he used to fish with my flies. And when he wrote a book, he he sent me a book out of nowhere, you know. Yeah. With, with a two-page thing about thanking me for, you know, all the beautiful flies that I've tied from over the years and everything else. You know, it really, it hit here. Oh, that's you know, awesome, get that, Yeah, they get that kind of recognition. I mean, Stu is just like, you know, he he's taught like, everybody. Jose, uh, Flip, Flip Pallet, you name yep. it, you know. Uh, he's in that level. All, they'll all bow down to him, you know, Stu. <laughs> and he's still, he's, he's, I think he's in his 90s now, and he's still, he still does these, uh, you know, all these award ceremonies that they're still doing for him, he's still he's still kicking. He's still he used to be an airline pilot, and uh, for Delta, I mean, he's just a, an incredible, incredible fisherman, an incredible person. I fished with him once down the down the vineyard, and he outfished us all ten to one, ten to one. <laughs> it was ridiculous. True professional. That's yeah, awesome. yeah, exactly. And you know, and he's still humble about it too. Good, good yeah, guy. Usually, the good ones are right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Joe. We really appreciate you coming on. It was great. Great. Oh, Again, I, great I, learning. I had everything. a ball. Yeah. So, yeah. I, and we'll see you throughout stuff. the shows. We'll <laughs> see you at the Plum Island. We'll see you at the Rissa show. Are you going to be, uh, we yeah. just sent out an email the other day coming to our show April 29th again. We're back. Oh, at yeah. The, I'll definitely be there. Yeah. We're back awesome. at the um, the Elks this year. Yeah. yeah I'll definitely venue. be there. No That's question about yeah. it. I mean, you know, it, it's my waters. Like, I, I, you know, I have to be there. It's my Absolutely. waters. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's how I look at it. Awesome. I, awesome. I can go all over the, you know, northeast, but this Newberry report, that those are my waters. That's your home, man. That's where we love yeah. to be, right? Yep. So yeah. good stuff. All right, guys. Everybody, right, thank guys. you for listening. Joe Cuckler. Um, Cal- 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 I gotta Cal- say it like that. <laughs> hey, I'm a Velasquez, so all right. So saltwater custom flies. Okay, he's he's from the Northeast. He fishes the New Report area. He's up and down with all the shows. Please check him out. He's a great guy to talk to. Learn a few things about fly fishing. And um, yeah, if you guys want some any other information, if you're a member of Mouse of the Merrimack, we're gonna have a little bonus podcast here with me and Dan. All right. If you're not a member, you want more uh, fishing information, please sign up to mileswithmerrimack.com. Take a look. And thanks for tuning in. And thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate it.